We're live. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Regeneration Transport and Scrutiny Panel. Um, anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name's Councillor Gary Parker, and I am the uh, chair of this panel. We've got a number of items of business um, uh, here tonight. Um, I'll start with any urgent business. I'm not aware of uh, any urgent business. Um, item three is declarations of interest. Anybody got any interests? Um, I'd like to uh, declare an interest on item six, with, which is the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust. Um, uh, as I sit on the board of the Heritage Trust, uh, if no decision is being taken regarding the item, I can still chair. However, if a decision is being taken, I have to exit the meeting for the duration of the uh, item. However, on this occasion, the panel is asked to only note the verbal update from the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust and Museum and archive collections. Thus, no decisions are being taken. So I'll therefore be present on this particular item. Um, on the uh, minutes, um, you've got the minutes of the uh, 24th of June meeting, which wasn't that long ago. Are they uh, agreed as a true record of that meeting? Agreed. agreed. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we will go into item five, which is the Woolwich Works follow-up report. Um, we did have a, a presentation from the um, uh, director of Woolwich Works uh, at the last meeting, um, but uh, the, the report uh, is, is come this evening because um, uh, it needed some follow up work on the previous one uh, before the previous panel meeting rather. So um, we've got uh, Pippa, Pippa Hack and Daniel Stainsby from uh, from Dres to um, uh, start um, the presentation on this. So over to you. Thanks, Chair. So yes, I'm gonna just wish you through the report and then we'll open for questions. I've got Sarah Abley here with us as well. She's working very closely with uh, the Woolwich Works Trust and Punch Trunk, the two tenants, who can help answer questions around any specific elements uh, associated with those areas. And um, just, I guess, before I start the report, just as a follow-up from the last meeting, since um, James presenting to the committee um, has actually gone live now with his ticket sales. So if you do go to the Woolwich Works website, it's worth a look. Um, the tickets are live. The programme of events is live. Um, and it looks really great, actually, from, from what I've seen of it. And uh, Sarah will just give an update on that bit later on uh, if there's questions around it. So, um, sorry, could I just ask? There's a, a, an echo. Have you got two um, devices open or something? There's an echo or something happening? It might be helpful if everyone, perhaps, who isn't speaking goes on mute just to help with that. Thank you. Is that better, Anne Marie? Much better. Thank you. Yeah. Sometimes when you've got multiple. Uh, uh, open might you get a bit of feedback so yeah so just going through the report so the aim of the report is to provide an update of what's been happening on site um, and an update on where we are with the tenants uh, and probably most importantly a piece around some of the social value we're get, getting out of the scheme because I'm aware that cropped up at the last scrutiny meeting and um, I know there's some interest in that so just taking you through the pr principal section of the report section four so you'll probably remember back in March 2017, Cabinet took a decision to commence the project. Um, at that point, we had uh, acquired a number of buildings. So you see under 4.4, they've just shown a map of the site explaining the five buildings that we've acquired and have been redeveloping. Um, buildings 17, 18, 19, 40 and 41. Um, what's been happening since then is there's been an extensive programme of refurbishment, extensions and repurposing of those buildings. Um, the primary element of the works is, uh, is complete. However, the site is still in a construction phase. It's in a fit out phase now ready for show opening. Um, and that's looking like show opening on the uh, buildings 40 and 41 in September this year. The um, James um, updated the board at the last meeting. 
23rd of September this year is when um, the uh, the Woolwich Works Trust shows will go live. And then the other buildings are um, working with Punch Drunk, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, so in terms of the works, as I say, the, the primary construction works completed, but we are now in a fit out phase and we're looking to have that complete ready for September this year. Um, also we're in the process of reviewing the um, all of the final costing. So I don't have a cost update as of today, but we can come back to that at a, a future meeting if that's um, what you would like. Um, in terms of the actual progress on site, so we achieved planning consent in 2018. Um, the scheme, as I discussed, has been a large scale refurbishment of the buildings. They are old buildings, um, ranging from many years old, um, have been quite um, left um, alone for some time. So they needed quite a bit of work doing to them. Um, we got to the point of uh, entering into the construction works in September 2019. Uh, and got onto site. Um, and what we found with the buildings, so there was a number of challenges, which I've set out in uh, 4.11 of the report. So you'll see there some issues around flooring, structural issues in the building, and so on. So there's been a number of challenges on site, I would say, as we've um, gone through the refurbishment works. But actually, we were making quite good progress. And of course, then we'll what happened in March of last year is some of the coronavirus pandemic hits. Um, that meant we had to um, briefly stop work on site and reconfigure the operations on site to comply with all of the social distancing rules and the guidance we were getting from government around how to deal with all of those matters in the contract. Um, that work was undertaken and the site recommenced. There was about a three week downtime. But as a result of the social distancing, the site was um, not as productive. Basically, we just couldn't fit as many people on the site as we would have done without COVID. Um, so the net effect, really, of all of those technical challenges on site, coupled with the um, coronavirus pandemic, meant that the completion of the works were delayed. In parallel to that, um, obviously, the tenants, um, given the coronavirus pandemic, they decided to delay the opening of their shows as well, because um, you weren't able to fit the audiences into the uh, various um, parts of the building. Now, as I said earlier, we have finished... Um, the major element of the site, but the construction now moves into a fit-out phase, and that started in um, in the middle of June. Um, I say that's due to complete in September this year. So that's pretty much where we are in terms of works. In terms of the tenants um, that we're looking to um, lease the buildings to, so there's uh, this is described in 4.15. So we split the five buildings into two leases essentially. Building 17, 18 and 19, we we're in the process of leasing those to Punch Drunk, an immersive um, creative theatre organisation, world renowned. Uh, and then buildings 40 and 41 will be leased to the Woolwich Works Trust. And then at a point, point in future, they will take responsibility, most likely for the, all of the five buildings. Um, we've obviously, as I described me earlier, the, the Trust are busily preparing for opening. That's the 23rd of September and Punch Drunk setting out they should be opening the site in spring of 2022. Um, in terms of the actual lease arrangements, um, some of the details are set out in the report. Um, got a 30-year lease with the Woolwich Works Creative District Trust. It's on the basis of a peppercorn rent, but with some turnover, so we get some income um, back to the council at a point when they're financially stable. Uh, and Punch Drunk that actually comes with a rent return to the council and also got some turnover rent provision. Um, there will be both of those leases will be subject to some decision reports which will be coming through the system fairly soon for the leader. So you, you can see those um, um, coming through the system fairly shortly. Um, so that's section four, pr predominantly the social elements. So starting at 4.23, I've just set out there um, together with Sarah some of the benefits for getting out of the scheme. So there's a range of uh, key performance indicators that have been attached to the lease around local jobs apprenticeships, uh, outreach, engagement with the community, um, partnership working, volunteering and so on. Um, and there's a requirement uh, in there to recruit local people. Um, so um, the aim is to uh, secure 400 jobs as a result of the project and some of the inward investment attached to that is set out in 4.26. Um, now, in addition to all of the great social value elements we're getting through the leases, there was also some requirements within the construction phase as well around social value. So we managed to um, secure employment for local people. So nine local unemployed people were, um, got employment during the construction works. 
uh, and we also achieved some apprenticeship places and there's been a great work with GLAB uh, and Michelle there. We managed to also do some boot camp work uh, and um, support another 28 people there who were looking for employment, um, plus some volunteering work there around uh, the local community. So I think sort of through the construction phase, we've managed to secure social value um, and also through the ongoing long term relationships with the trust in which Punchfront will be securing some social value. Um, and from what I've seen of the programme of events, there's some great things coming up on site, some world renowned people that are in the programme of works with the trust. And obviously Punchdrunk will be a huge attraction to the site. Um, so I think that's probably just a very brief summary. I suspect it probably makes most sense to pause there and open for questions unless there's anything specifically you wanted me to go through in the report, chair and draw out. Um, perhaps we'll come back to some of those things later if we need to, but I'll, I'll take uh, questions from uh, or comments from members first. So um, first up, I see uh, Councillor Gardner. So over to you, David. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I must say that um, as when I was in the cabinet, I did support this. Uh, so I have to be careful what I say. Um, and I hope it's as um, good as um, Daniel says. But when we supported it, it was 32 uh, million pounds uh, that was going to be spent. And I've heard a lot of new figures uh, in terms of, so I'd like Daniel just to confirm how much of the council's money in total has been spent on this so far and what will the total spend be at the end of the refurbishment, not only actually on the refurbishment, but obviously on our uh, management, legal, consultancy costs and so forth through the whole uh, project. Is it, you hear rumours of 50 million, 48 million, 42 million I've heard, but so it'd be nice to sort of get some something definitive on what the actual cost of this is. And also there was a lot of debate, I remember, in terms of what the payback period will be uh, for the borough. What is your estimated payback period? And related to that, you said that we're getting from the trust a, uh, a cut, if you like, in revenues. And I wondered what the cut would be. And I want you to say that Punt Drunk are paying lease. I wonder how much they're paying. Um, in terms of ensuring we get that uh, payback. Um, also, Chair, um, and Tracy has to close her ears, I've always been very concerned at the loss of the Heritage Centre. It was always originally part of the plan. The Heritage Centre would move within the arsenal, but that would be managed in such a way and would be seamless. So there was a sudden change of an inex inexplicable change, which presumably Prunch John wanted that space and, and they were moved into temporary um, or dispersed, really. I mean, the, red, the archives are in temporary. David, can you get to the point of the question? Yeah, where, where will the Heritage Centre be in these plans? Um, because we do have that commitment to the Heritage Centre um, and, and with a long-standing commitment to the Heritage Centre, including, uh, including the archives. And finally, then, um, my question is in relation to on the, on the same theme, really, a lot of their revenue seems to be driven by having weddings there and so forth. I just wondered if we'd factored in and discussed with RGHT uh, what the impact might be on their wedding business um, and other, other functions and so forth. Are, are we working together uh, to, to build that market overall uh, rather than working in competition between different venues? Thank you, Daniel. There's a few questions there, so you might want to uh, uh, take them. Yeah, I, I, I scribbled down some notes there, um, so I'll try and address those as best I can. Um, in terms of the spend discussion, I think at the moment it's too early to answer that specific question, David. The plan will be, because of course we're in discussions with the contractors around wrapping up all of the costs and doing the final cost analysis um, uh, phase where where they said the construction works are nearing completion and we've still got the fit out works to do so I don't have a final figure as I sit here today um, so I think it's best because it, it, I know that will be a question for a number of members I think it's best if we come back to that in September and give you a bit more of a detailed update yeah, yeah. at that point in time uh, rather than give a number sorry now. to interrupt you Daniel can I suggest we've got a meeting on the 30th of September um, and if those figures are available uh in September that they're brought to that particular meeting, if that's okay. 
I think that's probably the best thing and that, that should work that timing. I think what will also be really helpful is to get um, members of the scrutiny board down to site as well to show them. Yes. And yeah. what I suggested to chair as we were talking about this meeting is maybe do that after recess so you can see what we've done down there. Um, and we've just been talking today with um, Heritage England or English Heritage around the site because it was on the Heritage at Risk register. And we're just hearing today that I think they're actually looking to take it off the Heritage at Risk register, which I think is great news. Um, and I think it'd be a really great opportunity to take to site, see the nature of the work. At that point as well, we'll be very close to opening. So we'll have some really good information from James and the Trust as to how well they've done with all the ticket sales, which would be a great piece of information to understand. And then we'll have all of the costings finished by that time so we can do a complete sort of wrap up. I think that will work better than trying to talk yeah. about numbers now uh, that are going to be wrong. I'm, I'm a, I, I agree to that, da Daniel. Are, are, are panel members OK with that? Then we can get the figures of the whole at the September meeting. Yeah. OK. Th thank you. Clear that it really doesn't matter if it's not the final figures. At least there's a progress. So, it, you know, it can be OK for us to see a progression. So yeah, yeah. hopefully or... by then, Anne-Marie, we should have uh, all, all of the figures. Uh, but yeah, if even if, as she says, if not, I, I mean, hopefully we'll have some uh, uh, consistent figures that can be um, uh, shared with us. Um, uh, sorry, there was a number of other questions from David there, uh, Daniel. Yeah, so in terms of the leasing arrangements around turnover rents, so that's um, that's got a mechanism built into the lease. Um, some of those details will come forward when we've um, got the lease reports coming through the system for the leader, so there'll be some information in there. Um, what we've done is we've tried to build in a mechanism that enables a suitable return to the council but obviously not putting a massive financial strain onto both particularly the Woolwich Works Trust so it kicks in at a point where they've got enough of a surplus in their reserves in order to remain sustainable and not fall over basically so there is an element in there where that will stay under constant review attached to the KPIs and when we think we've got to an adequate position where they're stable operational and, and, we're, and looking sustainable then that turnover rent will kick in. Um, similarly, with punch drunk as well, there's the same mechanism. Um, there's a rent, uh, there's a rent attached to to punch drunk as well, and that again will be included in the report. It probably can be a bit sensitive some of that information. It probably makes sense if we capture that in the leaders' report um, rather than talking through the specific numbers here. Um, but yeah, there is both a rent return for punch drunk and a turnover rent mechanism built into those uh, into those lease arrangements. Um, in terms of the arrangements for the Heritage Trust, um, I think that's ongoing conversations. We're having discussions with um, Tracy around what the future arrangements are for the Heritage Trust. We know they're over Anchorage Point at the moment. We've done a lot of work to create a facility over there that's operational. The future beyond that, I think, is under discussion. I don't think we have an actual agreed strategy for that yet, but there is discussions ongoing. Um, I know Tracy's had co discussions with our regeneration colleagues as well around the future. So I think that, again, will probably be one that will be subject to future decision and direction. And now I guess in terms of weddings, I think it is it is built into James's plan, but I don't think that's a key element of his plan. Um, there is some space in the building um, that you'll see when you come round that opens up into the courtyard that will be a great location for events. And that doesn't necessarily mean just weddings. It will mean all sorts of things for the community and for the council to use. Um, I think that's definitely part of his business plan, but I don't think that's the key part of his business plan. It's a small element of the building. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily see that being a strong competitor taking away business from elsewhere in the borough would be my view of that. I mean, Sarah may want to add to that, um, but that would be my view of it. Okay. Um, I, Chair, could I just add on the Heritage yeah. Trust, um, just to clarify that Jeremy Smalley has been in discussion with Tracy around um, this her security of tenure, if you like, on the Anchorage Point uh, industrial estate. So the lease runs until 2024. It's not impacted by the school proposal, but it will ultimately be impacted by the east-west route of Charlton through Charlton Riverside. But we're not anticipating that that would be um, require any premature vacation of that site earlier than the lease end. And in fact, 
it's unlikely that the road, that element of the road would be built um, very soon after 2024. So we are in discussions with Tracy about coming back to Woolwich and what that might mean um, and looking at a range of options in terms of Woolwich Works, but also other things in the heart of the town centre. So, for example, Woolwich Exchange might present an opportunity as well. So, so it's very much on the agenda and um, we want to support the Heritage Trust in terms of its return to Woolwich. OK, thank you for that. Um, David, I think we have we missed anything else on of all your questions being responded to? Been skirted around, I think, Chair, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get some of the information yeah. uh, that um, yeah. uh, you um, suggested uh, in September, but I do think it's better to have, we have all the financial information in the round here, so um, hopefully we can progress that. Okay, the next speaker then is John Farhi. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Daniel, for the report. Uh, I think I've got three questions, really. Uh, it is the case, is it not, that uh, members have agreed uh, for the uh, Heritage Centre to be uh, restored and uh, relocated uh, in the, uh, on a date to be agreed. Uh, I'm interested in uh, paragraph 4.11, uh, in which you highlight the issues relating to uh, the... Um, additional things that need to be done with the building. Uh, is it the case that the report going to the leader for decision uh, includes uh, additional financial resources uh, for those buildings? And I'm really surprised to learn uh, that there are different arrangements in terms of leasing, both in respect of uh, Woolwich Works and um, in respect uh, of Punch Drunk. Um, can you confirm with certainty uh, that uh, Punch Drunk uh, has uh, confirmed this intention uh, to leave the building uh, in North London? Uh, and are you aware if a date for that uh, has been agreed? And finally, in relation to the spend, um, can you set out in the report coming forward in September uh, the costs in respect of the buildings currently occupied by um, Woolwich Works uh, and those likely to be occupied by uh, Punch Drunk. Thanks. Okay. Okay, no problem. Um, just in terms of that last question, John, uh, that will be fine. Um, in terms of, I'll, I'll take, I'll answer those in a slightly different order if I may, because there's some of the bits I'm familiar with, some of the bits I'm less familiar with, so I might open up to, to others to chip in. In terms of paragraph 4.11 which was some of the challenges with the buildings so um, when we took them over a number of them have been empty in in parts of the buildings for some time um, you see there in the report I refer to some of the age of the buildings some of them hadn't really received maintenance on them for some time and you may well have had a chance to look around them before we started work they were in a quite poor state of repair um, so as we opened them up we start to do the refurbishment works, you uncover things. Um, all of those matters have been dealt with. I talk about in that section. Um, so some of those challenges, I think it's just the nature of working on that type of building. Uh, you know, they're listed buildings with, with old buildings, not built in, probably built in quite a rush back in the days of the war uh, and needed quite a bit of work doing to them. And in terms of the leader report coming forward, that would be to tackle the lease matters uh, there won't be any requests in there for further funding so it's really to address the two leases so we have um, already in place uh, and there was a previous report that signed off an agreement for lease that we've got with punch drunk that ties them into the building and um, they will be leaving their north london building in fact i think some of the team have already left that building and are working locally uh, on site at the arsenal um, and they are committed to moving into buildings 17, 18 and 19. And we're very close now. We've got basically agreed terms. We're very close now coming forward with the final details of that lease arrangement. So I'm very confident all of that's in place. Um, and the reasons why there's different arrangements between the two is because the intention is that the Woolwich Works Trust will have oversight of the whole site, all five buildings. So they're on a longer lease. 
and Punch Drunk are a shorter term tenant. And of course, Punch Drunk are a commercial organisation. So we can deal with those in a different way in terms of rental income. So it made sense that because the lease durations were different, to have slightly different arrangements, albeit the social value elements are very much the same. Um, Sarah, no, Sarah will say if you've got any specifics around that, around the, the key performance indicators attached around jobs, employment, outreach, volunteering, they're pretty much mirrored from one lease to the other. But the durations are slightly different because punch drunk arrangements are slightly shorter than the trust arrangements. Um, in terms of the heritage site, I'm, I'm, I must admit, I don't know if there's been any member commitment around location. Um, so that's probably one we'll have to take away and look at unless others know. I mean, obviously, as Pippa mentioned, there are conversations already underway with the trust around what the future looks like and where they may be located. So we will obviously come back to that at some point once that's agreed. But uh, in terms of a member commitment, that probably predates me. I've not been uh, I, I didn't start with this project. So I don't know if there was conversations before my time on it that I'm not familiar with. So I couldn't answer that one specifically today. Um, I think that probably covers all of those questions. Okay, That's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Next is Anne-Marie Cousins. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the, I've noticed what everybody said about this. I think the only area that I was concerned about, I don't know if it's too late at this stage, is really to do with the community um, benefits, the, the social benefits. And whether at this stage, I mean, it is millions of pounds, uh, what can be done in view of, for example, the recent incident in Woolwich, what can be done to deal to, I don't know, to sort of include and bring in those young people, it's, you know, massive development is happening. What are we doing to try and make it as inclusive as possible so that those young people who are feeling um, excluding from, from most things. And I know sometimes people mention a youth center, it may or may not be something along that line, but you know, what can we do with this development for that, for them to be a place for them to be safely, to be creative, to be included, basically. Sorry about that, but it, it needs to be asked. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think the questions, um, Sarah, do you want to jump at this, in at this point and explain the sort of strategy with the trust and the KPIs? Yeah, so so both the trust and Punch Drunk have in their KPIs a commitment to do outreach work with schools and with um, organi community organisations uh, around the borough. And that's been a really important part of agreeing um, them coming into, into the, the site. Um, and additionally, it's not just young people in education as well. Some of the kind of employment opportunities, apprenticeships, um, mentoring, work experience is all about helping young people into the creative industry and to, to give them some real valuable insight, um, skills building. And uh, this is probably uh, going into uh, Michelle's area of expertise, but the uh, the what they're describing as the team jobs in, in Woolwich Works, which are um, a lot of what you might consider entry level jobs. But actually, as we all know, entry level jobs often come with you need this much skill or this much experience these days. Um, they're actually doing it a different way, whereby they're, they're going to recruit using behavioural competencies rather than saying you need to have a skill or you need to have experience to help take away some of those barriers for local people. And all of those um, jobs will be recruited through GLAB as well. So they're all uh, priority to, to local people. And then the idea is that their skills will be developed and built upon to help them then become get into the more skilled jobs in the creative industry. So there's a pathway in there right from um, being um, in school with the outreach and then community groups right up to uh, getting into to work and uh, getting into the creative industries. Um, from a community point of view as well, uh, particularly around Woolwich Works, what they're looking to be is not necessarily, or while there is a community rates for hiring the space, that's just one aspect of what they want to do. They want to bring um, communities in as part 
partnerships. So it's not about just paying for a space because you can do that in a community centre or another building. And one of their strategic priorities is de described as offering a creative life support to individuals and organisations and acting as a catalyst for collaboration. And that means working with grassroots organisations, local arts organisations to help support them with expertise, um, not just a room and, uh, you know, give them profile. And they're, they're already doing that in the programme that's announced. Um, the uh, Makers Collective, which is a group of um, artists from Eltham and West Greenwich, they've got an exhibition that will be in Woolwich Works um, for Black History Month. And um, that again will be a, a community exhibition. So that's an example of how, how they've already started on it. So it's a really, really important part of why we're working with a, a, a trust like, uh, like the one that's being set up, because the social value aspect, the community aspect is just essential to making sure that it, it contributes to the community in ways other than just the, the economic benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds really good. Sounds interesting. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I've got Charlie Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sarah's quite comprehensively um, covered most of what I was going to ask on, but I guess just the only other question I have is, and it might be that, Daniel, you, you, the best place for this to be answered is in that um, key decision on the leases. But um, obviously, you know, given the fact that the punch drunk lease is a commercial lease um, and is held with a commercial company, I assume that is going to include a break clause as well. Um, obviously, there is a hope that that will be used from either side but given that Woolwich Works would then take on board the entire site that's quite an increase in the amount of space they'd be using so is it um has it been planned in one is there that break clause and two have Woolwich Works done sort of you know work for if they needed to as a contingency take over the entire site earlier than predicted I think uh, in terms of the lease specifics, it probably does make sense to capture those in that decision report. Um, in terms of the what I know of it is uh, the, the show, the punch drunk show is intended to be five years, uh, whereas the Woolwich Works Trust are there for 30 years. Um, so it's a relatively short lease in any event. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head without going through the details specifically around break clauses, but I'm sure that's something we can pick up in that lease report. And I think, you know, we, we've got uh, the team on this job who understand, you know, how to operate commercial leases. So I'm sure that will all be picked up in the correct manner. Uh, in terms of the Woolwich Works Trust, um, yeah, the strategy would be that they then take responsibility for sort of looking after the whole site uh, in terms of what that phase two looks like of when punch drunk wind down and leave sites that will get be again subject to the future kind of discussion there there was some early talks about that i think in the very early days of the project around what phase two looks like but i don't think that's really crystallized yet um, but of course, uh, it will be an opportunity for the trust to carry on some of the work we've talked about around social value. There's some spaces there that would lend themselves to doing lots of different things that are probably different to what the other buildings do. So I think it'll probably bring a bit of diversity and a bit of expansion, but uh, it's, it's too early to be concrete about what that looks like. But um, I think there's flexibility built into the system is probably the summary of what I would like to say. But yeah, we'll pick it up in that um, in that future decision. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, I've uh, I had a few questions. Some of them have already been answered, so I won't um, uh, pick them up uh, again. Um, my, my I guess the outstanding ones is they've been slightly touched on, which are around four point two five and four point two six. Um, obviously, estimating estimating jobs in creative industries. Um, is uh, always a challenge uh, at the best of times. I mean, this report says 400 jobs uh, over the next few years. I wasn't entirely clear uh, what period that was for. Um, I mean, obviously, we've already created some construction jobs, so that's a good start. Um, but is there a projection for the next year? I mean, I presume, obviously, COVID's made all this very difficult. Um, has uh, is there a projection uh, for the next year or two years? Uh, if you haven't got that information now, perhaps you could forward it to us. Um, 
the other issues uh, are around apprenticeships and internships, which um, uh, could be uh, potentially easier to uh, introduce. So I wonder, again, is there any figures, um, are there any apprentices um, uh, engaged already uh, on the work of the, um, on Woolwich Works uh, and any internships in place? Um, I'd be very grateful for any clarification on, on those issues. Okay, I think there's probably one good one for Sarah to come in at that point. So apprenticeships are part of the KPIs. Um, so we have got commitments around the, the apprenticeships. And in fact, um, GLAB are helping at the moment with Woolwich Works to get some of that recruitment started for uh, apprentices and they should be uh, advertised imminently was the, the, the word that was given to me. So um, that's really good news that already uh, kicking off with apprenticeships. Um, in terms of the employment projections, um, I believe they do exist. I don't have them to hand right now, but we can certainly uh, help provide some of that information. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the facility is going to be open in September and I presume they're going to have some staff on site and maybe create some extra jobs uh, for that. So I appreciate that, you know, the original estimate, I think, was about 2000 jobs, which is, you know, in a few years ago. Um, but I'm you know, this is a key issue um, um, and COVID has obviously had a massive impact on this um, in the local economy. But um, I, I presume there must be some uh, people, um, unless it's all being done from existing staff uh, that they've got there already, uh, some jobs being created, even if it's if part-time ones uh, for this new programme season. And um, can you give us post this on the apprenticeship figures? Because I presume from what you're saying that they've not actually recruited anyone yet, but are in the process of doing. Is that correct? Yes. So there's yeah. not been a lot of recruitment at Woolwich Works uh, yet because of, of COVID, but it's all kicking off now. And um, all those, uh, the team member jobs that I spoke about, things like that, they're, they're all going to be recruited for the season. And, you know, Woolwich Works didn't have any staff before this. They're brand new. So every single job is a, a new job yeah. um, that's going to yeah. be in the horror. Um, Perhaps when we get the report in September, we can have an update on that because the programme will be running then. And I appreciate that people will be um, uh, employed by then, whereas they may just be in the process of recruiting now. I, I don't know, but if we can have an update on that when we get that in September. OK, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the officers and I'd like to thank Daniel as well uh, for coming uh, tonight um, and uh, engulfed with son's birthday party now. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you very much for that um, item. The uh, next item, um, which is an appropriate follow-on, is, is around... David. Sorry, sorry Chair. I mean, I just, I just wanted to say, based on obviously what John, uh, Councillor Fahey said as well, I do think we need to go back as a scrutiny panel to issue... I, I know that the scrutiny panel visited before, which is our obligation to the Heritage Centre. And I do think that there should be some sort of either report in the Woolwich Works report in September as to how this will be met, because it was always part of the Woolwich Works plan, as it was the, the cultural quarter, the Heritage Centre would be an anchor to it, as it were, or one anchor to it. Um, and I'm a bit bemused as to how it suddenly changed and so forth and what's happened and, and the sequence of events. And uh, there is a lot of concern, I know, uh, more widely in, in the public about this. So I think as a scrutiny panel, we should either have a report on the Heritage Centre, including the archives and where it will be housed in Woolwich uh, by September, or it should be part, ideally, of the uh, Woolwich Works report in September. So we can have some assurance it will be uh, reintegrated uh, back, into, uh, back into the cultural quarter. Yeah, David, I think you're jumping the gun a bit here because I was going to raise these issues after Tracy's given us updated information. We have had this item has been to the panel because obviously you weren't on it previously uh, a number of times with regards to the Heritage uh, Trust and will be uh, coming back. But I, I do agree, uh, Daniel, if there's any information as part of that report in uh, September that you give us with relation to the Heritage Trust, it would be good to have an update on that. OK, yeah, we'll, we'll note that and come back on that one. OK, thank you. OK, Tracy, then over to you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Raymond, am I able to share a PowerPoint presentation? Is that something that's doable? Yes. Um, so sorry, uh, yes. Um, no, that is. Excellent. Thank you. Um, in which case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, um, first of all, introduce Janet Denny, who um, has been invited this evening. Janet's our new Head of Public Programming for Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust. Hello. And I'd ask Janet this evening just to present to the panel um, some information about our project that was funded through the pandemic by Arts Council England and Historic England, um, which was an online exhibition called Living in Greenwich, Tales Through Time. Um, so I will hand over to Janet to give you a, a brief presentation about some of the work we've been doing um, over the last 12 months. OK, good evening. Um, I'm Janet. I'll just share now um, the project that we were waiting on. We had I joined in September and the first six months of that were, were spent um, putting this exhibition together. So let me do that for you now. Uh, the host apparently has disabled my sharing. Raymond, can you enable her, please? <laughs> uh, she has access. It says it's disabled. Oh, that's strange. Um... Try now, please. Oh, yeah, there we go. Can you see that? Yes, yeah. Great, okay, thank you. So um, this, is, this is the project to, how would we engage communities during the pandemic? So the project is an online exhibition called Living in Greenwich, Tales Through Time. And this, the reason it came about, this is us, the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust, you're probably all familiar. So we look after the heritage for the borough and we have Charlton House, the Archives Collection, War Memorials and the Tudor Barn. So pre-COVID, um, we're obviously the finest Jacobean house in London. So we did all the things that you would do in, in this sort of property, weddings, room hire, public events. Some people hire some space in their offices. Um, we have learning and outreach. We had uh, loan boxes that we'd give to school. We have an archive where people approach us for research and we have community engagement projects uh, where we take the collection out to libraries and different um, locations around the borough. And COVID hit and so we had to stay at home and all of this activity stopped. So there was no opportunity for the public to engage with our assets in the traditional way. But this did sort of give us an opportunity to look at how we did engage with the public. Um, the world had gone virtual, so we had to consider this. And we were very lucky that we were able to get two emergency funding grants, one from the Arts Council England and one from Historic England. Um, and you'll see that quite a proportion of that was actually to help our staffing. Um, and then within that, there was money um, to put together this exhibition. So we got permission from them to combine the projects, which meant we could do a lot more with it. So our objectives agreed with both of the funders was to ensure that the the community groups and families that we usually engage with were able to download digital participation resources to celebrate the different aspects of the care, that, the collection that we looked after. And then also to give away for the people in the borough to find out about the history of Greenwich using our collections, our built assets and our archives. And part of this as well was to purchase a cataloging system and then to look at how we would develop a born digital policy so that we could start collecting and effectively maintain digital records to kind of get us more up to date in the 21st century. We obviously had outreach and engagement aims. We wanted to really strengthen and widen the relationships locally and um, very specifically within the board of Charlton and about a walking distance of the house and then to make sure that we we were inclusive and 40 over 40 percent of the population uh, from different cultures who so wanted to make sure that everyone was included um, and to make sure that people also then as well as engaging with us online knew that we were physical and to keep that momentum and relationship going so that when we were back open they would come back to us and again to keep a digital archive from this project that we could keep into the future 
So first of all, we really needed to understand who the community is, who are we talking to? And so we looked at the last census, which as you'll know, is probably about as far away as you can get as we've just undertaken the new one. But from that, we learned that there were 90 different languages spoken in Greenwich and the largest communities were Nigerian, Nepalese, Turkish, Punjabi and Vietnamese. So knowing all this, the project we put together was how do we learn about the past through objects? What's important about them? This is what we're charged with looking after. So we have these random objects in our collection, but why are they so important? And we learn a lot from them. And we now need, we've been through a really important year and people in the future will want to know about this year. So how can we leave a record into the future? And we wanted this exhibition to be really accessible and in plain English. So we uh, worked really hard with a, a professional um, exhibition developer to pick some objects from our collection. And we wanted to make sure that we represented all of the different wards across the borough, that we represented the main communities in the borough and it was relevant to Charlton House and Greenwich as a whole. And then we spoke to different people in the borough to get their voices online so that they could tell their story. We wanted it to be inclusive so as well as being online, we did have to be aware that a large percentage of people don't have access, um, ironically. And so if we were collecting into the future, we did need to make sure that we weren't excluding anybody. So we developed links with the library network and we did have some leaflet distribution. The activities that we put online were very simple. You didn't have to get a lot of equipment and a lot of extra bits to go with it. And you could download anything in black and white only not assuming that everyone had access to print, coloured print. So this is the exhibition. I'll just quickly show you what we put together. Um, sorry, I shall find another screen. <laughs> there we are. So that's the exhibition. This is our online. So as you can see, we had the welcome in the five main languages. And we, on the first page is a very broad summary about the exhibition. We have a nice little animation here that takes you through the whole thing. Jenna. Oh, is it too long? <laughs> no, you're still on your... Yes, you, we, we can't That's see right. it, Jenna. Oh, let me stop and share again. Um, as we whizzing through. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay. So as I was saying here, when you come to the home page, you get welcome in the different languages. You have a summary of the exhibition. There's a nice little animation. If you get a chance to look at that, it's quite funny. It takes you through the, like the whole thing in one minute. Um, and then we look here, a little taster about what you can see, a Nigerian chess set, a medal for school attendance. And these are the voices. But we wanted to make it absolutely clear that when we talk about Greenwich, we're talking about the whole borough and not just a part of it. So we wanted to put that map in and that, that links to our social media. So I'll just quickly whiz you through how we looked at the exhibition. So we have these objects. So there's about 40. So we've got, as I said, a chest set from Nigeria. We've got a baby's hammock from India. Um, we have some Nepalese player flags given to us by the local uh, greengrocer. And if I show you how it works, so you click on an object like the gas mask, it comes towards you, you get some history. And there's always a question relating to COVID. It related back to wearing masks now, talks about the diseases and asks the COVID story. So all of the objects did that because ultimately we're collecting for the future. And then it linked in with the place in the borough where it was found, the period it relates to and um, the subject, which was health and then it would link to the resources on our resource page. So all of the objects do that. So there's quite a broad selection. The community tales, we have a selection of people that live in the borough. So you may know these people, we've got the green gross, uh, we've got Donald the osteopath, we've got a cafe owner, we've got a musician, we've got a school child, all with a particular situation that's come about from the pandemic. How do you homeschool when you're trying to work? So all of these people talk through how they've been affected. And then the activities, these all link with key stage, key stages. So um, 
we can use them into the future with our school groups. You can download them if I show you uh, this communication one. They've all got a little activity that you can do at home. These are the objects from the exhibition, a cuneiform, something about hieroglyphics there, a little uh, game here, something about how we communicated in the 30s. And then of course, you can just look at that in black and white if you need to do so. And then ultimately, we're asking people to share their story. And they can either come into the libraries and give us something or they can get in touch with us, us and we will get back in touch with them. So that was the exhibition. I will just quickly go back to my presentation. I won't take too much of your time. So we were able then, it gave us a platform to do lots of things. We could develop our learning. We got in touch with all the teachers in the borough and we know that we can build on that into the future. We weren't able to do outreach, but again, we emailed them this link and um, we communicated with them through the marketing. We had a big marketing campaign, which just put the trust and put the exhibition and our collection back in front of people. We did a lot with the press. We contact, we were involved with the newsletters from the council. We went direct to all of these uh, groups that we, we knew about. We worked with consortiums with Visit Greenwich. This is our leaflet that we put out and about asking people to get in touch with us. And so the outcome served us really well. It gave us something to talk about on our social media, something to say. It re-engaged with the learning. It reminded the community about the trust. Um, we managed to get in touch with different communities that we hadn't worked with before. We were able to upgrade our cataloging system and develop a digital archive. And we were able to build a relationship with libraries. So that's all formed the basis of what we can now do now that we can go out into the world and we can give the content of this to our learning and engagement officers. And it meant that we didn't disappear completely for a year. Um, we learned a lot and we will really be going out in the next few months to try and get those stories from people. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for uh, that, Janet. Uh, Tracy, uh, back, back to you then now. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me just share my presentation. You see that, Chair? Yes, it's on screen now, okay. yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so thank you, Janet. That's just an outline of um, the work that we've been focusing on up until the end of March last year, since Janet started with us in September. Um, we remained on site throughout the pandemic um, at Charlton House, but with a much reduced staff, um, as many of the staff were on furlough were working from home. Um, but we all came back in order to deliver that project because as many of, many of the members will know, it's, it's difficult to work with a museum collection and archive when you're working from home. It's um, important that you're actually with the objects and with the archives that we care for. And hopefully members will be <coughs> aware of the background of the trust. As Janet said, we became a registered charity um, back in 2014 um, when the following assets were transferred over um, to our care. So Charlton House and Gardens, not the whole of the gardens, um, just the, the um, walled gardens and the grounds up to the Ha Ha and the rest of the park is um, still the responsibility of, of the Royal Borough. Um, it does include Charlton Assembly Rooms and um, the building, the bricks and mortar, not the car park. And Tudor Barn in Eltham is also um, part of our estate, although it's, it's fully tenanted um, to a, a very good commercial tenant. Um, those of you um, Eltham councillors present will, will know them well. Um, we're also responsible for other service provisions. So um, as has been raised tonight, we care for the museum and archive collections of the Royal Borough, which are currently housed um, in a purpose built and designed storage facility at Anchorage Point on Charlton Riverside. And we also act as a, in a custodial role to a number of war memorials and other memorials across the borough. Um, so that's Mays Hill, Eltham, 
and West Parkside Gas Workers War Memorials, the Ha Ha Road Memorial, which is an obelisk to Major John Little, a commemorative memorial, and also recently um, a programme of Victoria Cross paving stones that were laid between 2014 to 2018, and we also act in a custodial role um, for those items. Um, already tonight, um, members have discussed um, the museum and archive collections and their access. Formerly, they were available at Greenwich Heritage Centre, and as Daniel um, and Pippa have already outlined, um, that building was closed. Um, there's a plan in train for the museum and archive to return to building 18 on the Royal Arsenal. Um, although, as Pippa says, I have been in conversation with um, officers regarding um, other future models um, for the museum and locations in Woolwich, particularly around the regeneration agenda um, in, in the heart of Woolwich. And obviously, the, um, as Daniel said, that extension to the timeline for Woolwich works and the creative dysemic, and therefore the extension to the lease period um, for punch drunk into building 18 will have an impact on, on our own timeline. But we have continued to provide access to the collections through our public programming, um, as Janet's already mentioned, um, and also through providing public access to the archive records um, down at Anchorage Point itself. It's not been possible during pandemic. It's um, a, a very small space, quite a confined space, um, and is available for one-on-one -on -one research. But we are planning um, when, when we're able to reopen that appointment process, and we'll be reviewing that later in the year. Um, the key thing that we have been able to do, though, during the pandemic is we've started an inventory process. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you some cataloguing and archive inventory detail and hopefully make it sound really exciting because it is a really exciting, um, a really exciting project. So you can see on this slide and um, this this is the for those of you that haven't seen it. This is um, our new archive store um, down at Anchorage Point. So the image on the left hand side is taken from the rear of the store. So this is the climate controlled space. Um, so what you're he seeing here is um, a very um, high standard of archival um, controlled environment for both the archive and the museum collection. And then outside of this space, there's probably the same size storage area again for those items that don't require such a high standard of environmental control. So the museum are significant in size, um, and it's really important to us as an organisation um, and for the borough, of course, that, the, that local people have access to this information um, and people further afield because it has some really rich content. Um, so, but hopefully you can get an idea from these two slides is just the volume um, of material that's stored down there at Anchorage Point. And um, we don't have a, uh, a catalogue <clears throat> so that people can actually access this information so the process for people to get hold of it and find out about our holdings um, has been quite difficult historically. Um, so this slide, but what we've done over the last three months is um, we've started a top level inventory process for those shelves that you saw in that last slide. Um, so the museum and archive team um, with support from um, our admin team have gone through those shelves and identified the things that are sitting on each of those shelves. Now, it's very top level, but what it means is for those people who might have some inquiries about Kidbrook and the holdings that we have about Kidbrook, for instance, we can instantly see that we've got copies of the Parish Church magazine from back in 1931 up until 1980. Um, if people have got an interest, then we, we've got archives from Woolwich Archaeological Records um, and the Woolwich Dockyard. We've got the archaeological reports from 1972. Um, and you can also see that we've got um, information about parish records. And this is just one of the um, holdings from one of the shelves. But this is a, a top level process. Um, and it, it seems like <clears throat> a, quite a simple process. It, it's taken quite a while to, to record all of the information. But what it means is that for researchers, local historians, um, just local people with an interest about their local area, they can contact us. Um, and actually have a look online once we make this available and see what holdings we have. Whereas in the past, what they would have had to do is email us, phone us or come and see us and actually access these um, materials in person. So it makes the search process much more accessible, uh, much simpler. 
and also means that we can reach much more people. Now the next the next stage of this is actually to drill down and catalogue these holdings in more detail process. Because as you can probably imagine in each of those box on each boxes on each of those shelves, there are probably anywhere between 20 to 100 documents or objects um, that each need individually cataloguing. The system has been updated and funded by Arts Council England to enable us to do that. Um, it's a lengthy process, but we will be reaching out to volunteers and the local community to ask for their support to help us deliver this piece of work because we feel it's really vital um, to improving access um, and also to improving the way that we help people understand our collections and our shared history. Um, the other asset that we're responsible for that many of you will be familiar with is Charlton House and Gardens. Um, as many members will know, we um, were and still are a vaccination centre. Um, so we've had over 20,000 people um, visit Charlton House to get their first, second or both jabs um, since the start of the year. Um, they will be remaining with us um, up until the autumn at least. Um, Members might not know, but Charlton House used to be a convalescence hospital for returning soldiers in the First World War. So actually there is um, an historic providing healthcare and um, help in the community. So we're proud to, to remain part of that historical narrative with Charlton House. And um, this does of course impact our wedding business slightly. So as the 19th um, arrives and people are looking for wedding venues, um, our main wedding venue is the old library and that will continue to be um, a vaccination centre. But most people are quite understanding that that is quite an important role that we're playing. Um, commercially, we've been working with Green Goddess who are um, a, a, local, a, a local licensed uh, retailer. And we opened a beer cafe on our patio back on April the 12th when we were allowed to do so. Um, and Green Goddess have stayed with us Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays um, retailing locally produced um, London ales um, and beers. Um, Marianne, the, um, the wife of the partnership, is a beer sommelier. So if anybody has a, an interest in um, interesting beers and brews, then um, they're a, a really good, really good organisation to visit. Um, and whilst they've been with us on the patio, we've also supported other local catering businesses um, who've been there normally on a Friday or a Saturday evening so that we can add a, an extra layer to participation. Um, if anybody was in the park on Friday, you will have been as excited as I was to see that our Friday classical music concert has returned um, onto the patio. So uh, Stephen Moore, our musical director, is um, conducting the brass band there. Um, it was incredibly well attended. It was a beautiful Friday afternoon, very sunny, very warm, um, probably between 75 and 100 people. Um, some of the concert goers are our regular Friday concert goers. They're the ones front and center with their own seats or with seats from our cafe. But what was also really nice was that there was a lot of attendance from people who just happened to be in the park. Um, and you could see as people arrived in the park um, how happy it made them to hear classical music being played. Um, and some of them stayed to participate, so it meant we got a much bigger family audience than we would normally get with our Friday concerts, because if children didn't want to stay for the hike and then get up and move later on. But some families chose to come for picnics as well. Um, so that was really nice to welcome Stephen and the concerts back. And we'll have a concert programme now on the patio um, every Friday for the next eight, eight weeks. So weather permitting um, and the sun will continue to shine and we'll continue to have performances there. And you can also see um, a team of our garden volunteers. We've been really fortunate and um, we've actually grown our volunteer base um, during lockdown because of course we're um, fortunate to be responsible for such beautiful gardens and, and walled gardens. We've worked with the Charlton and Blackheath Amateur Horticultural Society and gardener Jason Carty and they've transformed the pond garden, uh, which is the, the walled garden. You can see the volunteers standing in on that slide. Um, and also at the beginning of the year, they started work on the long borders, which is the, um, the area with the beach hedging just outside of the pond garden. Um, they, it's required a huge amount of dedication and commitment from local people, but they've absolutely risen to that task. And we look forward to continuing this work um, with them. Um, I'm sure they won't mind me sharing because they've just shared it with me, me this evening, um, but they've also been awarded through the Greenwich Neighbourhood Growth Fund um, round four, 
um, five thousand pounds towards planting in the long borders. Um, so the volunteers will be really excited about that, as are we. So that will create some beautiful planting in those in in those long borders. Um, we have found that people are valuing more than ever the green spaces that we're responsible for. So we're really excited about the opportunities that offers us um, in the future. And we'll continue to, to work on the gardens um, and, and grow those, those garden spaces. Um, Janet's already shared with you the, the core funding that we've got through lockdown. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see this slide, but I just wanted to, to let members know that we also got some funding from Historic England um, to carry out a detailed assessment of the roof at Charlton House. Um, so this is the report that has come back from um, Purcell UK, our appointed architects. Um, their assessment of a complete repair um, and replacement works to the Charlton House roof has come back in the region of about 1.2 million. There's some additional works to get while we finalise. Um, so we will be carrying out some fundraising works over the coming months um, to identify how we'll, we'll raise those funds. Um, and we will be making a, a public appeal through the Big Give campaign um, in giving local people the opportunity to support the roof works as well um, and encouraging pledges towards the roof works. So we're, we're quite excited to get that resolved. There was some significant water ingress during the lockdown period, um, which does run the risk of damaging um, some of the most significant spaces up on the second floor. So we want to resolve that um, those issues quite quickly. Um, as Janet mentioned, we continue to grow our schools program and um, our commitment to community outreach. We've just been able to uh, reappoint to our community outreach post that was left vacant during the pandemic. So we'll be able to deliver our second year of National Lottery Heritage Funded Meet the Collections program. Um, and it feels like we'll be in a position to come out into the community a lot more and to bring our collections um, out to local people, um, as well as expecting them to, to come to Charlton House to, to visit with us. Um, we delivered our first family program, which was bunnies in the beds. And um, we did that in the spring. So it was really nice when we were allowed to have larger groups out in our green spaces. And um, so we, we delivered that financial year, but we were also able to welcome back our volunteers. And you can see two of them there who were supporting our holiday explorers program. Um, and that was delivered sharing our museum collections with young people. Um, in Charlton House, you'll see the um, Venus and Vulcan overmantle in the, in the background of the picture there. So it was really nice to get the museum collections out of storage. And as you can see, they um, enthrall young people to look at the weird and wonderful things that we have in our museum collections. Um, so as I say, we have welcomed 20,000 people through the vaccination centre and, and through our programming um, over the last, last six months. Um, and I think our gardens have been better used than they ever have been before. And I speak anecdotally, um, but I'm sure um, Councillor Gardner will probably be able to vouch for me as a, a Charlton resident. And um, there are lots more families making use of our green spaces um, at, for outdoor play um, for outdoor meetings. So we're really focusing on the gardens and green spaces over the coming months. Um, and we're also working with our colleagues um, at the council as we celebrate our ability to to meet and um, get, get together again with the summer festival in August, which will be taking part in Charlton, Charlton Park um, and on part of our estate. So we're really excited about that for the summer. Um, so we've got lots of plans ahead and um, I'll open the floor up to questions, Chair. Thanks, Tracy, uh, for that. Um, uh, please raise your um, digital hand if you want to ask any questions. Okay, I've got a question from Anne-Marie Cousins first. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm a little fidget, so, <laughs> so sorry. First of all, Chair, um, and I'm relatively new to this panel, so I wasn't too, really certain of what the report would cover, but just to say the Greenwich African Caribbean Organization, um, which I'm the chair of, we do have a, a memorial tree planted in the mem Memorial Garden of Charlton House. So, but so is it right for me to ask a question? I mean, yes, I, don't know, course, yeah. I don't know if that's prejudicial. I we haven't benefited from any of the funding or anything. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's great. It's great to hear the number of things that, um, that, that are, are happening. And definitely, I think one of the things this uh, lockdown has shown is just how valuable 
our green spaces are, uh, it's le led to conflicts actually with people um, wanting space and wanting to do their own thing. I don't want to hear the other person doing their thing. So it's brought up other issues as well. But can I be cheeky and pose the same question to yourselves, which is about those young people who are not engaged for whatever reasons and getting into all sorts of trouble on the streets. Is there anything that you can do or are you planning on doing anything to try and engage? Because I think one of the things we need is lots of little things happening in lots of different areas rather than thinking, oh, well, you know, the Woolwich guys will do this and so it covers everything because it just won't. And I have the same difficulty for things in Abbeywood as well. So I'm not expecting you to cover everything, but you know, you're taking on board anything that you can possibly do or trial to, and it's, the, it's those disengaged ones and they've got skills and talents they are just using it the wrong way. Thanks, what do you say? Um, I say thank you for raising the, council, the question, councillor, and I know your tree very well and your celebration annually, so thank you for that. Coming up. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes, please send We get an invite. So do send us that invite and we'll promote it for you and get our gardeners along. Um, I think it's a really important point. Um, you, you mentioned the, the sad situation in, in Woolwich um, Town Centre just last week. Um, I'm, I'm an historian by profession. And um, whilst a lot of the work that we do is around inventory and collections care, I'm a firm believer that um, the, the way that we live our past we, and the things that we learn about our past have a huge impact on the way that we, we live our current lives and the way that we, we live in the future. Um, so I really think that history and heritage and our shared cultural heritage has got relevance for um, all young people. Um, so we always consider engagement with young people, but I think there's there's a lot more that, that we can be doing. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to have conversations with, with any um, other partners and, and any other wards um, who would like to access the collections in particular ways. Um, we, we have with our Meet the Collections program, been out to Thamesmead, been out to Abbey Ward um, and engage with groups um, across the borough and we'd be happy to continue to do so. Um, so yeah, absolutely open to, to any suggestions or any local ward support we can give councillor yes we'll have to think about that as well ourselves thank you yes okay. uh, thank you uh john farhi uh, uh thank you chair and uh thank you tracy and um uh, for the presentations uh this evening um i just want to uh say really how appreciative i think we all are of the contribution that both you and the staff at the uh, uh, trust has made during the pandemic and the uh, the way in which you've managed to um, uh, operate uh, under very difficult circumstances. I didn't know the band was um, uh, back, uh, so I'll be bringing a chair along in the in the next couple of weeks, really. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to to raise again, really, the question of the um, uh, the heritage centre, and it's uh, it's something which. Uh, you probably inherited, so um, uh, it's not really um, a major issue for uh, for the trust. But I think Pip Pippa said out fairly clearly the steps that were being taken uh, in respect of um, looking at the future of the uh, heritage centre, uh, and obviously the pressures on the Charlton Riverside site uh, is eminent uh, in the short and long term. Uh, so therefore, uh, that's encouraging. But I think. Um, I want to uh, make a big shout out really for Building 18 and the Arsenal. I think uh, both members uh, and residents uh, were quite shocked to, um, in a sense, felt that the Heritage Centre was snatched away from them in the dead of night without members having an opportunity to discuss or influence um, or um, uh, encourage uh, residents to have that discussion and I think um, we need we need we owe it to the residents of the borough and more particularly we owe it to the um, the generations uh, of um, residents in Woolwich uh, to have the Heritage Centre back in its proper place uh, in the arsenal and um, I'm not starting a petition now or chaining myself to um, uh, the uh, the gates of um, the arsenal but that might happen sometime in the future. But I do think it's an issue that needs to be resolved sooner uh, rather than later. But uh, in any case, thank you for all you do um, at Charlton House. 
Um, I don't, is there any update you, you can give us on that particular issue or, or is it all still in, in train, so to speak? And um, for me, Chair or from Pippa? Uh, either of you. <laughs> I think Pippa's just going to reiterate what she said earlier. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I guess from um, members have already asked for a, a report back in September, which and Daniel, Daniel will provide. And I imagine before then, um, Pippa and I, or Pippa and one of her team will, will meet to discuss what the, the proposals might look like. Okay, yeah. uh, th thank you on that. Pippa, I don't know whether you want to add anything. I know you've um, made some points earlier on that, or Daniel did. Not, not really. I'm not sure that we'll have the final solution in September, but it will, you know, we're committed to working with Heritage Trust and we hear what uh, you're saying about its relocation back and that you wanted to go through Royal Arsenal. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to review whether that's possible or what, if that's not possible, what the alternative options might be for members to consider. So, but, you know, the, 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 the commitment remains that we want to work with Tracy and her team, and we will. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much. And so there'll be, there should be some more of that in, in September. Um, David Gardner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't really have any questions. I just wanted to echo uh, what Councillor Fahey said in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, debt of gratitude I think we owe to the trust uh, for the work they have done through the pandemic, uh, through opening the doors of Charlton House. Um, I had both of my uh, vaccinations there and it was very efficiently uh, organised. It's, it's Someone else who is from Blackheath actually said to me when I was having my first vaccination, it's wonderful to come and be vaccinated in a, in a grade one listed building. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's excellent. Um, I suppose really my question is around the, uh, the, the sort of structure and sustainability of, of Charlton House and for that matter Tudor Barn. And I know that you have as a, um, a trust has, has been uh, very successful in accessing funds for projects and staffing and so forth. Um, but I wonder about whether what, what assessment there has been in terms of the re, um, the asset management and, and the investment that's required to maintain and improve uh, Charlton House, because there are still some quite a few sort of, for want of a better word, municipal type elements to the uh, to the house and certainly the interior uh, that don't really fit so well with the historic building. Uh, and, and also an update on the on the summer house, where I know you've made a great start, um, but not sure what future plans are. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, I think that's a very good point. There's, um, members might be aware that we produced with funding from National Lottery Heritage Fund back in 2018, 2019, a resilient heritage um, project which delivered a master plan for um, Charlton House and Gardens um, with total cost of, of works around about 25 million um, for repairs, maintenance and development. And the plan had been that we would start a first phase of application and fundraising, um, approaching National Lottery Heritage Fund for a significant proportion of a, a, a first phase application, starting on the ground floor. And then pandemic happened and um, National Lottery Heritage Fund with many other funders changed their funding priorities. Um, and then we had the roof report. So um, it, we will be looking, I think, at that strategy again. Um, we now need to prioritise the roof as, as urgent um, and those um, rooms on the second floor um, because there's some repair work. For those of you that have had your vaccinations in the old library, you might have noticed that there's some damage to the plaster ceiling um, because of the water ingress. Um, it's great that 20,000 people have come to Charlton House who've probably never been before. Um, but then I've also had lots of emails from people saying, why is there that hole in the roof? Um, so it's really important that we prioritise those those things that are damaging um, the damage in the building and address those. Um, so we will be relooking at that 10 year strategy and at the fundraising strategy um, and taking a, a different approach um, to our funding. Um, so we'll, we'll bring a, a report back to you, um, Councillor, when we've done that, but it will probably be um, 
next year by the time we get around to, to relook at that. Okay, uh, thank you for that, um, Tracy. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone else <clears throat> who wishes to speak on sorry, this Chair. subject. Um, uh, sorry to read me to interrupt, but Councillor um, Gardner did ask about the Summer House as well. Oh, yes, of course. Um, sorry, yeah. So funded by um, Historic England. So we're just coming to completion of the second phase um, of those works. Um, so we'll be reinstating some of the original panelling. Um, so there'll be some interpretation elements in there. Um, and then there'll be a, a final phase when we reinstate the ceiling. So we'll need to do some additional fundraising for that. Um, but again, we are open to interim uses for that space. So if there are any local organisations who might want to come and have a look at that, um, for a, we're thinking a communal space at this stage rather than a, a commercial use. I think a, a commercial or higher of it might be a, a later stage. Um, but for any exhibitions or um, programming use such as that, we would be open to um, approaches from the local community. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody else who wishes to make any uh, further points. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank Tracy and Janet for their very comprehensive and colourful presentation. Um, it's always nice to see uh, the community um, uh, come to life and uh, there is a technology to do it these days. So thank you very much for that. Um, here, here. And um, uh, the Heritage Trust is a very valuable asset as a board member. Uh, I've been very pleased to sit on it for, since its inception, I've been on it for seven years. I didn't even realize it was that long. So it's seven eventful years. And um, uh, hopefully we'll see uh, uh, one above you back again uh, here soon. Um, we'll move on to the next item now, which is uh, an update on the economic development strategy for uh, the borough. And we've got Michelle Ranking, Ranking um, who's going to uh, update us on this. It was due uh, last year, actually. I, I did have a meeting, if you can remember that, just before COVID. It was actually going to be on the scrutiny panel agenda for April uh, 2020. So that was good timing. Um, uh, and of course, uh, an awful lot has changed since then. So uh, there's been more work going on about this. Yeah. Um, it's not been finally completed yet, uh, but I wanted to bring Michelle back to give an update and to take some views and comments from elected members about this. Um, that's just to sort of set the scene. And we've also got Mariam Lolivar as well, who's the new um, uh, cabinet member that covers this area. Um, so welcome to uh, uh, Mariam. Now she's more hey. to, uh, uh, more normal uh, online persona. Um, so over to you uh, first, Michelle. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so as you rightly recall, this was due um, really to be published um, in April last year. Um, and I, I think it's probably helpful just to recap to say that the, the themes uh, in relation to the economic development strategy really broadly fell um, under four key themes. Um, so very much linked uh, to the core priorities around delivering economic prosperity for all, so prosperous people, which a big focus on jobs and, and, and skills, prosperous businesses, prosperous places and prosperous communities. Sorry, just, I just want to interrupt you for a second, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, th there's some background noise. Can people put themselves on, um, if you're not already on? Um, th thank you, everybody, for doing that. OK, Michelle, I think I'll stop now. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, and so the strategy also very much uh, was underpinned, if you like, by two uh, cross-cutting themes, and that was particularly around sustainability and, and digital. Um, and I'll come back and just kind of say where we're at in terms of taking the work forward. But I thought, actually, Chair, it was important to um, highlight some of the work that's gone on. Um, so in particular, the immediate priorities uh, for this work in respect to the economy has been on um, supporting uh, business survival, uh, particularly during the, the various periods of, of a lockdown. We've seen large parts of the economy forced to close, and we've seen an uh, income falling dramatically in terms of uh, on businesses, in terms of restrictions that have been in place, uh, particularly around social distancing and indeed sort of household mixing. 
Um, so understandably, the focus of the work has shifted very much towards delivering the immediate priorities around getting grants out to businesses um, and to help to protect as many jobs as we possibly can in the economy. Um, so I'm pleased to sort of report that in terms of the work the council has been doing in this area, we've performed very strongly across London. And uh, it's probably worth highlight highlighting that since November of last year, uh, the council's paid out almost 12,000 grants uh, to businesses, and that's totaling 35.4 million. Um, and it's important, I think, as well to touch on uh, jobs and the labour market in particular. So in May of last year, uh, the council established a new integrated employment advice support service. Um, and this is really about to support those uh, residents in our borough that were at risk of losing their job or had regrettably lost their jobs, but also um, working in partnership with welfare rights, responding to the financial emergency and also housing uh, need for those at risk of becoming homeless. And, and I think it's probably worth noting to the panel that uh, the furlough scheme, I think, has been effective in holding down unemployment in, to some extent, although we know significant groups have been impacted, particularly young people, uh, women, and um, some uh, black minority ethnic groups as well. Um, but I think it's worth while well, adding that we know that that furlough scheme is going to be phased out and is due to end in September. Um, and I think then we're likely to see what the full impacts, uh, you know, COVID has had on the labour market and indeed jobs. Um, so I think it's also worth noting that because of that work and anticipating significant numbers of people going to be looking for work, the council's also secured through the government's uh, scheme uh, called Restart Scheme, uh, uh, 6.8 million to support those long-term unemployed uh, residents who've been out of work 12 months or more. Uh, and that programme will be delivered over a four year period. And then in more recently, in terms of, again, reopening the, the high street, reopening the economy um, since April of this year, um, we've the key focus of the work has began to be about uh, sort of working on things in line with the roadmap that was, was laid out from government. Um, and then clearly the shift of our work in terms of grants has to be, has uh, moved towards helping businesses to recover. Um, and we are continuing to work on initiatives like building on successful schemes that we did to kickstart the reopening of the visitor economy last year. It's time campaign. Uh, we've launched Street Eats. We've helped outdoor hospitality and there will be more work emerging in terms of our shop local uh, work piece. Um, so coming back really um, to the draft economic development strategy, it's fair to say um, that whilst there's been no significant progress in terms of the strategy specifically, um, I hope the panel will acknowledge that there is a lot of work that's going on that feeds in to supporting the local economy. Uh, we are about to get underway with refreshing uh, the economic de development strategy in relation to data um, to actually reflect uh, what's gone on in the economy as a result of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, and that will help to shape sort of new priorities and actions that we'll need to do to support uh, those pillars of our community uh, and ensure going forward that growth is, is inclusive. I think it's worth highlighting as well that it's clearly a still an emerging uh, piece of work because the economy, there's still some uncertainty um, and we can't predict with any accuracy what uh, it's going to be like, uh, you know, after the furlough schemes ended. But I think what we have identified is that there will be a requirement, I think, for definitely more stronger emphasis on themes like greening the economy um, and to help to address our climate change emergency. And just by way of example, during the pandemic, we've also launched um, a retrofit project, uh, which is a green uh, skills initiative. Um, and we've used the public sector decarbonisation scheme as a way of, of creating opportunities to support local people into those new jobs. Um, and I think the other area to focus on as well would definitely be around community wealth building. That certainly was always a feature of the original um, sort of draft strategy but clearly we are seeing the, the need for that different type of economic model uh, that supports a lot of our aspirations around, you know, supporting local businesses, retaining as much of the funding and monies that are raised locally 
to benefit local people. Um, and we've got some uh, time limited money that we can use to help us uh, shape that strategy. And so I just wanted to say as well in summing up really is that uh, we are working uh, closely with uh, the, the corporate team, uh, which is the council's program monitoring team. So hopefully this work will feed into a wider uh, council wide uh, area of work that's going on around strategic planning, particularly in the run up to, you know, setting the long term vision for the medium term financial strategy and the, all the objectives that will uh, come out of, of, of that work. So uh, thank you, Chair, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, yeah, I'll take questions and comments from people. Um, uh, Michelle, the first, the, the, the review period for this, the, the new strategy is going to be published in December, is that correct? Well, I think that's probably a little bit ambitious, given that, as I said, the furlough scheme is ending in September, and I think the Council's corporate work is really looking at trying to really do a state of the, you know, to kind of do the assessment now over the period of summer into autumn. So I think it's it's probably going to be into the new year. OK, um, so so but there's time for people to input into this and, and give their views as well. Um, um, OK, I, um, I, I've got um, David Gardner and then Anne-Marie Cousins uh, and then uh, Mariam. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in as well, Mariam. Uh, okay, David. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my first is by way of a comment, really. This, is, you know, we have been going around the houses with this for some time. Mm. I think it was back in two thousand and seventeen or so when uh, Councillor Sisway James was a cabinet member. Might have been two thousand and sixteen. I remember, you know, the first discussions, and I remember doing uh, a significant number of, of comments on the draft uh, strategy mm -hmm. then. We got some sort of outside consultancy to do it. Um, it never quite reached being finalised as a strategy, and now we're looking at it again. So I can see why we're looking at it again to some extent, but I wonder what we're losing here. And and to ensure we capture actually what you know the input that was there then. And I have two sort of fundamental points really. Um, one is that um, I. I do think that um, we've got to capture in this uh, strategy, and I think when we discussed this last as a scrutiny panel, we mentioned this, um, not only the circular economy, which you, you talked on in, in terms of environment and recycling, uh, but also um, the uh, ability to uh, maximise the value of the Greenwich pound, the social value of, and economic mm. value of the Greenwich pound um, locally, which is more than procurement uh, it, it is how we get people to spend local shop local buy local services so forth um, so uh, it'd be useful to have your comments again on that uh, just to reiterate that will be uh, fundamental and, and what models elsewhere that we've looked at uh, in terms of what we think has worked well in some areas and what maybe uh, has not worked so well um, and then the, the second area which I'm passionate about is how we actually um, increase the value of our economy and the value of our um, jobs uh, offer uh, to Greenwich residents. We have far too uh, many residents, many in BME communities who are very well qualified but cannot get jobs that are um, applicable to their qualifications, end up being in cleaning and security and uh, I mean, all important jobs, but but not paying very well and, and very insecure jobs. And how do we raise the value? You know, Canary Wharf, Stratford is going through this renaissance now uh, from, from a low base. Um, uh, Canary Wharf went through the renaissance. We don't have that type of, you know, external investment. But how are we going to make that move so we can actually not only grow local, uh, but go up the value chain from low value jobs. It's not just about hospitality and construction, uh, but about um, science, uh, engineering, uh, you know, fintech and, and so forth. Where, where's our, we've got Ravensbourne and so forth, but what, what, where is our USP and so forth? Where is our niche? Um, historically, it was science and then printing and so forth. And, and what work is being done on that to raise the, the value of the Greenwich economy? Thank you. 
Okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take a couple of contributions, Michelle, and then bring you back mm -hmm. in again. Um, thank you for that, David. Um, the next is Anne-Marie Cousins. I'll, I'll bring you in at the end, Mariam, if that's okay, after other people have spoken. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Cousins next. Um, lovely. Thanks a lot, Chair. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, it, I suppose what I'm going to ask touches a little bit. It's a slight variation on the the disengaged youth. I'm looking at the entrepreneurial disengaged youth. Sorry if I sound out of breath. I had to go find my charger. Um, so I'm plugging this in now. Sorry. So the um, yeah, what are we do? What your program and and the funding stream? It's something that. Um, I've possibly spoken to you about um, before I became a councillor, even because it's a long-standing issue that we have a number of young people who want to get into business. They've got entrepreneurial skills, etc. And and how is that um, being covered? I've heard the Woolwich Works. I'm assuming there's probably an overlap there, because um, I think it came up that it was something that Glab is possibly doing. So there might be an overlap, but. I do think, especially at this time, it's important that this platform is used so that people listening in can hear, um, you know, what we are doing because it's part of the, the, the problem that people are saying, well, we're not doing anything and what are we doing? And it just sounds mm -hmm. as though we're on this treadmill of saying, well, we're doing things, but people are saying, well, we're not doing enough or it's not the right things. So, yeah, so sorry to dump that at your doorstep, but I do... <laughs> <laughs> I do okay, I'll, I'll take one more contribution and then perhaps I'll, you can come back in, Michelle. Uh, John Farhi. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Michelle, for the, um, uh, for the update. Um, if we look across the country uh, and looking towards um, the future post-pandemic, uh, we see a number of initiatives being taken about how we can engage more of our community in picking up jobs and uh, opportunities uh, along the way. And are we adopting in Greenwich a holistic approach? Um, I know David mentioned um, about procurement, but procurement is important where uh, we're spending 246 million pounds a year uh, in procuring our services. Many of the jobs coupled with that, I'll give you an instance, social care, for instance, uh, all in the private sector, uh, much of it uh, low paid. Uh, and so therefore the spending power in Woolwich particularly is extremely low. So how can we accelerate uh, that opportunity um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the longer term? So therefore, I think the question I would want to ask are all of the uh, directors of the council engaged in economic development? Uh, how can each department in the council um, actively support uh, the agenda that we all want to see uh, being identified in terms of maximizing opportunities for local people? Um, how many local businesses can we bring in uh, to the procurement strategy? And I know uh, some work is being, some good work is being done uh, on that. So therefore, um, it's simply not what happens in Dres uh, during uh, every each day of the week, but what's happening across the council. And the other important factor um, is all of the other all of the other public sector organisations outside of the council. Um, if you look, for instance, what's happening uh, in Preston, Kirklees. Uh, to name but two, Swindon being another, where all the individual public sector partners are brought into a debate about how can we collectively work together uh, to, to improve the economic opportunity for uh, those that we uh, represent, many of them without employment forever. Mm. Um, we know only too well uh, the number of young people some excluded from school, others that don't want to uh, attend school and are looking for new opportunities. How can we bring all that together? How can we engage the schools, the college and all of that uh, in a wider agenda uh, so that we can uplift the spirit and uh, opportunities uh, for, for those uh, we represent? So hopefully when the report comes back in December, 
and uh, don't want to take up too much time this evening because there may be something else on television. But um, in uh, in terms of the wider agenda, uh, I think there's a lot happening around uh, that we ought to look to uh, for best practice. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you, John. Michelle, if you want to make, obviously yeah. you've only just heard these, so any comments you can make? Yeah, um, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try to capture some responses. Really, I suppose. Um, not in any particular order, because I think actually starting with the point you, you've just mentioned, um, Councillor Fahi, in relation to what can we do to bring all of this together? And these all of these questions are really meaty issues that get under the skin of really what we want to, to achieve through the economic development strategy. And I think there's lots of disparate pieces of work taking a place across the council that clearly is contributing to some of those things that we talked about community wealth building but we really do need that community wealth building strategy and approach to help us to bring that together under a really coherent um uh, clearly articulated narrative around that and and i think it, it's not just about what we're doing in the council uh, you've touched on some really important points about uh this is about all the other in anchor institutions in in the borough um, and again, we're, there's lots of good work, lots of great partnership work that's going on across the council with FE, with HE, um, with health and so on. Um, but it's making sure that we're harnessing that and making the most of those, those conversations and those initiatives so that we've got a coherent strategy going forward. Um, so I think coming back to the point in terms of the delay with the economic development strategy, I think it is unfortunate that it has taken uh, a long time to, to get it to this point. I don't think the work that we've done previously is, it has will be lost because uh, many of the issues, if anything, have become more, uh, more uh, stark as a result, it, you know, the pandemic has really just sought to, um, if you like, um, reinforce, if you like, the inequalities that existed uh, previously. And that's uh, now a bigger issue uh, as we come out of the recovery. So I think it will be important to make sure that that is captured, as I say, through that uh, community wealth building work. And I think talking about the quality of jobs, I mean, it's, I think this is where we need to think about the green recovery. And I know it's a term branded, um, and what does it really mean? And it's very, uh, no single definition that can articulate what a green job is, but, what we do know is that there is this major aspiration to, to uh, you know, to achieve car carbon neutral, uh, certainly as a local authority by 2030. And so we can't miss the opportunity um, of ensuring that we uh, capture some of those jobs of, of the future. Now, we know it's a very uh, it's going to be something that cuts across all types of uh, jobs and all sectors. It's not exclusive for the green, um, you know, the green sector of what we might say is a low carbon economy. Um, so it's going to affect both people in work and the jobs that they do, but also um, in terms of upskilling um, to enable them to be able to uh, do other work. Um, you know, that's going to be key. So that's going to be an important piece of the puzzle in terms of work as well that we do with the FE and HE. Um, have I touched on most things or is there something that I've missed yeah, there was some of the points that Councillor Gardner made about you know shop local and and around uh, you, you've touched on sort of um, high quality jobs but, but yeah. around that agenda. Yeah I mean there's lots of work we're doing behind the scenes I appreciate that that we're not formally launching things at the moment but uh, one of the areas of work that we've been doing um, is we commissioned some work um, to really help the retail sector so part of that was looking at you know kind of what those retailers needed to do we've seen that growth haven't we of online shopping and we know there's probably going to be some fundamental shifts in consumer behavior that will you know people will still want to do things online uh, we saw that trend all, already um, that's now accelerated and so how do we make sure that we can encourage people back um, to our town centers and high streets um, and so it has to be more of an experience offer, um, linking the, the retail offer with culture. And we've got some interesting things that we'll be able to, um, that will be announced shortly. But I think as well, we've got an opportunity with the Greenwich One card. Um, we've got, um, which as we know, it's a library, uh, leisure and uh, visitor economy. So, sorry, library and um, 
leisure card and it comes with business offers. And again, there's some further work that we're doing to, to relaunch and rebrand that in the autumn, but lots of work continuing to go on uh, where we, we'll be working to, with the local chamber of commerce. We're in the process of uh, recruiting through the kickstart scheme um, some shop local champions. Um, so they're going to be out up and down our high streets talking to businesses, getting some really good offers in. Uh, and then we really want to kind of launch that work um, again to, to try and to really emphasise the, the need for people to, as they have been, but um, shop local, buy local, and, and really building on that hyper-local offer that, that the pandemic has, has actually brought about. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'll bring in Charlie Davis now. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for sort of your answers so far, Michelle. Um, I, I actually, some of what I want to touch on is what um, Councillor Gardner, Gardner mentioned in terms of um, shop local and buy local. Um, yeah. I remember about this time last year, we passed a motion at Council, and so it is good to hear that there is progress being made on some of that, um, yeah. especially the point, I, I really like the point around the Greenwich One card. Um, obviously, you've said there will hopefully be some more progress on that in the autumn. Um, is there sort of can you give a, a firmer date or is there more information you can give on that because I think that's sort of um, yeah. from what we've all said I think that's really key so it'd be good yes to on that. so I think in terms of the official launch and sort of we will be looking to do that in the autumn but absolutely work is going on so we're working to rebrand the card at the moment Leisure Greenwich uh, Leisure Limited are doing some work uh, to their digital uh, platform to make it more user-friendly. Um, work is continuing on the council's web pages. So we're automating the offers um, at the, you know, to enable those when they expire that they come off automatically, but also um, underpinning that with some real sort of marketing, marketing and promotion of those new offers coming in. As I mentioned, the Kickstart Shop Local um, champions will be in post shortly so that work will will carry on and there is lots of work going on uh, behind the scenes I think it's just in terms of actually the the finished article of the rebranded re um, launched uh, Greenwich One card that will clearly have a bigger emphasis around the shop local work. Um, we're planning that launch um, in 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 the autumn, but certainly, absolutely, lots of work is uh, is going on uh, and will continue to go on um, over the coming weeks and months. Amazing. I've got just two more points uh, got on related on that one. Um, I guess the other one is, and I guess it shows where Mariam, you're. Uh, your sort of brief and um, the regeneration one overlap quite a bit is stuff like, I guess the economic strategy is going to be quite reliant on stuff like the new Plumpstead power station regeneration project and elements of that. And I know co colleagues on this um, panel were at um, Plumpstead Make Merry, but there's also interesting ideas. Sort of, you had a developer there, Nadeo, on sort of, you know shared living and working spaces. How much do the council think that can sort of be part of powering on sort of the local economy one but also sort of, you know as we recover from the pandemic do we think that stuff like that is going to be more important to our local recovery um, and I guess it wouldn't be an update on economics if I didn't mention the hospitality recovery grant um, and just from sort of my perspective I think it is, it is great that we set that up um, I know we sort of have discussed previously sort of between the three of us the fact that we've only sort of lent 33% of that initial sort of money we set aside. I know we've since sort of lent everything that we were given under the ARG. So I guess my question on that is, I know that there's, Marion, from your previous answer, there's more funding coming. Is it planned to ring fence some of that to go out to those hospitality businesses again? Or is there another way we can look at that? Because I think we can all agree, you know, businesses locally full stop have been really hit during the pandemic but I think really you know the businesses that have been most impacted and I'm sure you know Michelle from sort of your conversations with businesses but from from all of our conversations mm -hmm. as local councillors it really is those hospitality businesses that have sort of borne the brunt of it so it's just sort of you know are there more ways that we can sort of look to support them through sort of you know reboosting and reutilizing the hospitality recovery grant but also other ways we can be sort of more imaginative too in terms of maybe not uh grant funding but other ways we can support those businesses too 
Do you want me to uh, Yes, please. Start? You, you, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll I'm start with the hospitality. Shortly. Yeah, sorry. I'll start with the hospitality recovery grant. I mean, I think it's important to highlight that, as I say, we, we are a, a really strong performing local authority, authority in terms of our funding that we've got, particularly the discretionary funding that we've got from government, and we've spent that in full. Um, and I think the reason why uh, there was a smaller sort of percentage share, if you like, of, of the ARG funding going to those hospitality businesses was purely because uh, we've secured an additional 10.7 million of support, all of which was going to those hospitality businesses. So I think it's really important that, that we are proportionate in the way that we kind of try to support as many businesses in the borough. Um, so certainly our scheme was still in terms of the support that local businesses got. It was a more enhanced offer than the government restart, but it enabled us to support uh, some of those um, businesses who weren't eligible for, for restart. So suppliers to the hospitality sector, you know, all of those um, that rely on that hospitality trade, uh, be it, uh, you know, wedding planners, events, musicians, uh, and so on. So we, we had a very generous scheme that looked to support as many of those freelancers as well that many of whom weren't eligible for other support available. So I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly proud of the work that the team have, have done on that. And I think when we do get um, hopefully our top up funding from government, um, as we had been towards the end of the, the funding that we had in place, we were starting to move towards what we call a sector recovery funding, grant funding model. Um, and I'd be happy to sort of update you more about uh, how that support is helping. Um, but lots of uh, great stuff uh, going on there, particularly linked to um, some of the London recovery missions around good work, good jobs, Green Deal, um, healthy food. Um, and so there's, at the moment, there's been around sort of 15 uh, businesses that have got funding through that, that scheme. So I think that's really important work that feeds into the, the wider work around recovery. Um, and then I would just touch on in terms of the whole sort of home working, you know, after the 19th, yes, I suspect we there will be more of a hybrid model, um, but we're seeing uh, lots of reports coming out um, in the public domain around, um, it, there will still be some home working, it, it, you know, going forward. So I think in terms of that live workspace is going to be increasingly important that um, the regeneration developments coming forward will be delivering a different type of workspace and perhaps a different type of employment offer. Um, but uh, it's probably best for me to leave that to our regeneration colleagues who, who are the experts. <laughs> Okay, uh, th thank you for that, Michelle. Um, I'll bring in Mariam shortly. There's a, a couple of things I wanted to add in. Uh, some things I was going to mention have already been, been mentioned, so I won't mention them again. Um, it's interesting. We talked about, Anne-Marie Cousins talked about business support, which oh, I think yes. is, a, is, a, is a key issue. Um, my personal view um, is that we need to do a lot more to support women-led businesses. You know, um, uh, I think, you know, there's, there's been a, quite a significant increase um, in the number of, of women-led businesses out there. Um, and I think uh, this is an area um, uh, some of the local authorities I could mention, and I won't make, make any political points, Charlie, uh, don't do an awful lot for um, uh, women-led businesses and I think that's some, an area we could really capitalise on locally um, um, because there's a lot of interesting data out there to show that uh, often they're more sustainable than you know uh, more traditional business models and, and men-led businesses so you know it's something that could uh, really benefit as a, as a community. Um, the, the other thing is and, and you have touched on this is about those people um, who haven't got anything because of the way um, that some of the schemes were constructed uh, by central government, you know, um, uh, businesses uh, with sole direct company businesses with, with sole directors um, who were made mainly paid via dividends, which are quite common. And then some other groups of the self-employed as well. There's up to three million out there. Uh, many of them are really struggling at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then there's issues around claiming benefits for those groups. You know, I know, I know some myself who've been in that position. Um, so I, I think that's an area that uh, I know there is work being done um, mm -hmm. here. 
Um, and finally, around green jobs. Again, again, I know I had some discussion with Councillor Merrill about some of the things uh, when she had the Regen portfolio about some of the things that the council is doing. I mean, I think that is really a key area. It would be great to see properties in Greenwich with solar panels uh, supported by the council, especially um, um, or council supported businesses, uh, especially uh, new council properties where we can have some impact on there. I, I really do think uh, that that is key and training people in those mm. um, particular areas. Um, but I would like to pay tribute to what you've been doing uh, within your department and within GLAD in a period which has been very, very difficult and uh, trying to um, uh, get funding out to businesses and all the work that that uh, ensued. Um, I'm very encouraged by what you're saying about, you know, um, the, uh, the Greenwich Pound and the work around supporting local retailers. Um, and it's, it's really worth, you know, because I think your department is doing a lot of good work, but it's not always publicised. So at least we've got a platform to do that this evening, which I'm quite pleased about. Um, and perhaps we can get you back in, in due course, um, obviously about the economic development strategy, but about some of these other issues as well that you're um, working on. Uh, okay, um, that's comment really, so you don't have to respond to that. I'll bring Mariam in now. And uh, uh, Mari Mariam Lollivar is the new cabinet member for uh, business and economic growth. So welcome to the your first panel, uh, Mariam. And um, uh, to, just to make comments really, if you wish to on, on any, any issues that have been raised tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for having me tonight. Um the panel um just to kind of feed on i guess from michelle's points and i really you know i think the overview that she's given you gives you a really good sense of of the the work that is going on in the department and very much that kind of support that is going out to business um and i think you know it would be uh, it's important for, to me to acknowledge the delay of the report but i do feel that we have an opportunity here um for any if any report had already been created it it wouldn't be fit for purpose in the current climate that we're working in there's a significant amount of work that i think we need to be doing that i think um that is being done um to to reassess um this economic strategy in in the kind of the new normal i guess within the, the that we're going to be functioning in with the pandemic and with our recovery so it does i think create an opportunity for us to 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 plan that kind of like greenwich's recovery alongside london's recovery as well um and i think i would also say we, i would definitely take point of all of the kind of comments that are raised um today but also i i guess as cabinet member i wanted to kind of put out to to the chair and to the panel that you know I'm very keen as well to see how we can work with you on on pre-decision element to this so obviously we will have you know when we've in due course when the the department you know when that work has been done and I because I think one of the things that is probably worth highlighting is yeah that I can understand that I wish we had more to show you today but we are clearly not at that point and I think I did uh, mention it that could we come back later when we can show you some some of the real good work but sadly we're not in that position yet but I understand you were keen to get an update so we obviously would want to do that but what I think would be great is if we can come back and work with scrutiny to do that kind of pre kind of decision work alongside kind of you yourselves to engage with the community to engage with business so that we can really um kind of get everyone on board with uh, with that strategy and, and kind of get that feedback so i'll just put that out there and that is obviously something for the panel on the chair to decide but thank you very much for your time yeah yeah th thank you um yeah of, of course i mean you know uh marion and myself since she came into post have, have had a couple of conversations about things and and we are due to meet in due course i wanted to bring this out at an early stage so members would get a chance to comment in on this i'm, I'm sure uh marion will be receptive to any contributions from people either individually or, or collectively so um, uh, if you want to, if, if that's okay, Mariam, uh, that people can write to you about these issues. Please do. I'd love yeah. to. Hear and, and then if you can copy Raymond in as well and myself uh, so that uh, I'm not repeating the same issues uh, and, and adding to uh, her work workload. So, um, but, but yes, um, I think it's important um, personally. Um, um, I, I hope that 
uh, panel members would uh, support this as well. We're very keen. It's a key issue. Um, and um, the economic uh, development of the borough is something that benefits everyone. So um, if we can uh, get the strategy right, it will uh, enhance it. And I think there is some opportunity here um, um, to um, uh, influence and and to take part in the pre-decision um, uh, process. So uh, yeah, um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. But thank you, uh, Michelle and others. And uh, uh, obviously, if, if as things progress, maybe we'll bring you back later in the year uh, when, when things are clearer. Uh, we've got a, the September meeting, perhaps that's too early, but the, one of the following meetings uh, in November or December, maybe uh, when, when more work has been done. But uh, thank you all for your contributions this evening. Um, and um, as I say, um, this is the time that you're able to influence people. So um, uh, we will be talking uh, about these issues, obviously, but uh, Marion will accept um, representations and I will be talking to her and I'll bring any um, further information back to the panel in due course, uh, um, subject to the usual considerations. Um, OK, thank you. The, the next item is the commissioning of future reports. Um, the, no, uh, the chair. To note this, um, we are obviously bringing back uh, the Woolwich Works update at the next meeting and something about, and information about the uh, issues related to the Heritage Trust, um, which were noted by uh, the DRES officers. Um, and um, you can see on the agenda what's coming up, some uh, big issues on this um, uh, 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 panel, like the carbon neutral plan and the living streets implementation, and of course, other things, road maintenance in the borough, which is very important to a lot of people. So um, uh, there's a lot to uh, look forward to. Um, and um, with that, um, that's the end of the meeting this evening. So. Thank you all. Um, the other thing I would say is, is, Claire, if you want to get in touch with me again, I did write to you. I'm quite happy to go through some of the issues on the panel um, for with, with you and uh, give you some updates if that's so, if you want to do that. Yeah, that'd be great, Gary. I did respond to you, but I'll get back oh, sorry, to you. Oh, sorry, yes. I may have missed it, but um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check my emails again. But good, we'll, we'll do that soon. Okay. Um, John, did you want to say anything? No. Okay, then, then good, good evening to you all. Uh, thanks for your attendance this evening. Uh, and the next meeting is on the 30th of September. So we'll be well into the autumn by then. Uh, be interested to see where we are with the COVID-19 situation and whether we're still opened up. Uh, we might even have a live meeting then, uh, but we shall see. Uh, good evening. COVID-21. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, good evening, everybody. Bye. Good night.